Okay. Now, the title of this thing is Innovative Energy for Sustainable Development. Sustainable development is development which meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That's essentially what we mean sustainable. Moving towards sustainability involves expanding the definition of cost beyond just the short-term economic implication to include long-term economic, environmental and social concerns. Our entire development approach and economy has been fired by the use of inexpensive, plentiful fossil fuels. Recent events have demonstrated the inherent instability of this system. Our present energy supply is tenuous and stretched. Fortunately, the cost of energy and of technological progress are combining to make innovative energy a realistic aspiration that may provide a steady stream of new jobs, and this is very important, and secure energy sources. In order to reconcile sustainable development uh, with, the, with the, uh, an economic growth with a threat of environmental decay, coherent strategic choices have to be made, relying on truly innovative of uh, scientific and technological development. The huge progress in the fields of solar, wind, biomass and geothermal energies does not need to be here further discussed. In this short presentation, some other tentative, novel, new, and perhaps less known development will be briefly described. They are as follows. Number one, energy production for fossils without CO2 emission. This seems to be an absurdity because CO2 emission and fossils seem to go together. Well, they're not quite going together, as you will see in a minute. And there is a window of opportunity of running energy from fossils without CO2 emissions. As an alternative to what is well known and discussed politically by many circles, which by the way doesn't have my great sympathy, which is carbon capture and sequestration, which is another alternative. Two, recovering the vast amounts of already accumulated CO2 instead of carbon capture and sequestration to generate a liquid substitute to oil and that brings about something which is called the methanol economy. Unconventional resources of natural gas or clathrates, this is something which I like as a very interesting story which is worth discussing. Number four, superconductivity for electricity at truly long distances. And number five, an almost inexhaustible novel nuclear energy coming from thorium. This is the five subjects which I would like to have briefly discussed and presented to you. I hope we can do it in the time we have, but essentially this is a, the, the subject of the talk. Now, let me address myself still to general consideration. Lack of necessary investment for a change, current trends and their projection to the future, however, show that we are not entirely on a straight path to meet our energy policy objectives. Since the oil prices shocks in the 70s and 80s, we have enjoyed inexpensive and plentiful energy supplies. The easy availability of resources, no carbon constraints, and the commercial imperative of the market forces have, market forces have not only left us dependent on fossil fuels, but also have tempered the interest for innovation, tempered the interest for innovation and investment in the low energy technologies. On the other hand, the energy innovation process is generally characterized by very long lead times, often decades, to substantial markets, due to the scale of the investment needed and the technological and regulatory inertia, technological and regulatory inertia inherent in existing energy system. The innovation faces entrenched carbon-based infrastructure investment, dominant actors, improves impose price cap, changing regulatory framework, and network connection challenges. New technology are, at least initially, more expensive than those they replace, while not providing a better service. The immediate benefit tend to accrue to society rather than to the markets. Some technologic 
technologies face social acceptance issues and often require additional upfront integration costs to fit the existing energy system. Legal and administrative barriers complete this innovation resilient framework. In short, there is neither a natural market appetite, natural market, market appetite, nor a short-term business benefit for such a technology. That's unfortunate, it's a fact. Public intervention to support energy innovation is thus both necessary and justified. A new term in the balance, the decay on the environment, anthropogenic CO2 and other emissions and their predictable effects on the climate on Earth should not be, un should not be underestimated. It is therefore necessary to develop solutions for curbing and otherwise smoothly growing combustions of fossils expect to double again by 2050. The idea that anthropogenic CO2 releases affect the climate on Earth for hundreds of thousands of years has not reached general awareness of the public and of the scientific community. We have not yet reached for CO2 the same level of public awareness and concern as the production of long-lived nuclear waste. For instance, the plutonium lifetime is 26 kilo years, while the mean lifetime of fossil CO2 including his long-lasting tail, we reach about 30 to 35 kilo years. Now, let me show you here how long will CO2 last in the atmosphere. Let me give you some graph. You can see here the emissions for a number of possible choices. You can see that those emissions are largely exceeding... Oh, sorry. I guess what's going on here. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. This is giving me troubles. What the hell is that? Let go backward. There we go. Oh, come on. Hey, there we go. The large exceeding year 2100, all the statements that we have written by uh, IPCC and others, they keep saying us 2100, end of the world, but there will be a 2200, 2300, and there is plenty of coal, plenty of resources. Even if the developed country may decide to stop burning coal, there are enough people in the developing countries, developing countries like India, China, and other places which will love having burning coal, presumably Africa, and presumably <coughs> up to the point in which it will all be finished. In this case, the process of, uh, uh, of, <coughs> of uh, carbon associated emissions will go all the way up to 2300. And this is the result of that. You can see here in this diagram again up to 2500 and you can see that after having created the, uh, the, the carbon CO2 emissions, they stay essentially forever. <coughs> you notice the flatness of the curve after the moment in which the transition has taken place. To be more practical, these are some measurements which was done. The present, for instance, CO2 production, <coughs> remember we're only at the beginning of this line, is enough to fill the superfluid CO2, a volume of the Lyco Geneva, 80 cubic kilometers, every four years. And you can see there the effect of such a huge amount of CO2. Each one of our cars every year produces four times the weight of the car in terms of CO2. The weight of your car is four times heavier when it comes to CO2, and this is done every year. Now, if 5,000 gigaton of carbon were emitted, it means that most of the carbon will get burnt before we go to something else. That will be the situation. You can see in this diagram here, you can see the diagram is extended to 100,000 years. You can see the pre-industrial level in green, and you can see the residual uh, uh, support of uh, this other system, which go forever after the first initial decay. This is a very ca careful calculation done by very distinguished scientists, so it's not under... A discussion, and for the best guess case, after a thousand years, somewhere between 17 and 33 percent of cost of fossil carbon will still be there. After 10,000 years, between 10 to 15 percent of fossil carbon will be there, and after 100,000 years, which is, brings us down from the monkey tree to the present location, 7% of the fossil carbon will be there. So this is quite an impressive thing in practice forever. And this is something which people don't seem to understand, that when carbon is coming in, if it goes into the atmosphere, it will be terribly hard, almost impossible to take it out. No doubt, fossil 
global warming is a pressing issue. We deserve much attention. However, per se, may not be sufficient to introduce a worldwide quickly enough the huge changes that the massive decarbonization requires. There are, notwithstanding, much more pressing arguments of with vital economic nature ahead of us, much more vital than changing the climate change, no matter how important it is for a number here. A key element is the limited availability when compared to the demand of most of the used use fossils like oil and natural gas and the urgency of preparing ourselves adequately to alternatives. Central to this issue is, for instance, the necessity on substitute to petroleum, especially for transport, which today is the most oil-dependent, 95%, 97% sector in our economy. No doubt the consumption of oil will continue to grow, but a significant amount will come from politically unstable areas. We look at this paper today. This was written before the papers, before Libya. And increasingly for inhospitable regions, technological advances will increase the amount of recoverable oil. Oil will not be exhausted. Current reserves represent in many years' worth of supply, but market forces will inevitably drive prices up as demand surpasses supply, creating a true and long-lasting crisis of oil of incalculable or even dramatic economic consequences. Today, many scholars and politicians call for the immediate incubation of a long term energy solution prior to the peak oil scenario, which would force the economy to a grinding halt. Although additional drilling in areas such as the continental shelf, the Gulf of Mexico, off the west coast, Alaska and so may stave us the inevitability of the problem, it would be only a temporary solution. On the other hand, eliminating the use of fossils is not a realistic statement. New ways must be envisaged with an associated goal of decarbonization in order to avoid business as usual alternative of extracting massively the needed oil from shales, tar sands, heavy oils, coal-based liquid, which will vastly multiply the CO2 emission with respect to today's situation. Simply injecting this huge quantity of CO2 underground is not economically valuable. Sequestration is not elimination. This one should realize very clearly this is the point. The key statement we must convey is that with the help of innovative technology, the huge amount of CO2 from the fossils must be converted from a liability to an asset. Let me now briefly discuss the various alternatives. Energy production for fossils without the CO2 emission is one of my arguments. The majority of industrial hydrogen production comes from vapor cracking of methane in the, reforming, in the, in the reforming process, generating about four tons of CO2 for each ton of hydrogen. In order to suppress CO2, it must be concentrated and sequestrated either under the ocean or underground. This is a CCS situation, but half, up to about 40% of the energy will get lost in such a process. An alternative project is the pyrolysis, which we are discussing now, or the spontaneous thermal decomposition at high temperatures of methane into hydrogen and carbon. Cracking methane to carbon and hydrogen with no CO2 emissions uses no more energy than existing reforming process. The black carbon can either be sequestrated or sold on the market as material commodity or reduce costs by marketing the carbon as a filler or construction material. The absence of CO2 in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, the thermal decomposition process uh, uh, is the main reason for its development. And let me show you here the basic idea. The basic idea is a physical idea. You take some CH4, you preheat it to an appropriate temperature in a tube. And this is what we've done in CMAT and, uh, a few years ago. And we take a, an extra tube, and then there is a reaction, spontaneous reaction, very fast reactions. We transform a CH4 into hydrogen with a little bit of CH4, with a little bit of carbon, and all the other stuff like that. And the process essentially to be searched is CH4 plus heat, typically at the high temperature, here 600 degrees, 1600 degrees, becomes carbon plus hydrogen. Passing through a hot tube, CH4 quickly spits spontaneously into hydrogen and black carbon. Here is the di diagram of the, uh, the distribution. You can see the residence times is extremely short for the higher temperatures and the co concentration is essentially complete. The process can be performed 
<coughs> at lower temperatures than these with the help of catalyzers, which have been now discussed in a variety of places, and a plasma torch, which can produce a plasma as a practical way produces high heat. For instance, a plasma torch was described already and is developed by a company called Kverner Engineering. And it's, this is the picture, one of those units. A plasma arc process separates at temperature 1600 degrees, hydrocarbon into pure carbon and hydrogen with cooling water and electricity. This is a pylon plant, which is fairly large. It's producing something like 500 kilograms per hour of pure carbon and the hydrogen and so forth and so on and uh, uses about a megawatt or I, uh, two megawatts of electricity and one megawatt of hydrogen of steams. Next, next, next step is the plant construction of a plant capable of producing a yearly capacity which is much greater and a cost estimated to be somewhere in the vicinity of 300 million Deutsche Marks. The other possibility is the use of molten metals as shown in this graph here. You can see here in this graph essentially the dependence of the, uh, of the, uh, com the content of uh, hydrogen. And you can see up there that at 650 degrees, if the pressure is reduced to 0.1 megapascal, the hydrogen concern reaches 90% of volume. And this is how the device could be put together. This is an example which is taken by a Russian uh, group in which you see essentially molten lead which is inside the container. Hydrogen is, uh, methane is coming here from this tube. Bubbles of methane quickly transform themselves into hydrogen and black carbon. The black carbon is solid and remains floating on top of the liquid metal, while hydrogen comes in the, in the volume above that, is extracted, and it can be used uh, as hydrogen and separated out from, essentially, from the, uh, the rest of the system in a very obvious uh, uh, situation like that. Let's compare the pyrolysis of neutral gas with hydrogen production. In the column to the left, we have the uh, reforming, standard reforming system in which CH4 plus water becomes CO2 plus hydrogen. There are four molecules of hydrogen per molecule of CH4. The uh, pr process is endothermic, as indicated there. The important thing is the amount of CO2 emitted here is about of the order of uh, uh, 0.43 uh, uh, in quantity, while of course in the other case will be zero. It's, it's made out of a reformer, a shift, CO2 separation, uh, and liquid uh, CO2 goes into the oceans, gas well and liquefiers, and this represents a certain loss of energy. So the overall result is 75%, which is the energy production of this process, minus the 15% of going liquid CO2 in the ocean and in the aquifers, etc., which gives you 60% of efficiency and the energy loss will be 40%. The system of the classic system is by product value is low. It is the possible hazardous environmental effect, as you know, CO2 is a serious problem for people breathing it, and it is well developed. The other alternative we have here is the one which we are discussing now, which is taking CH4 into carbon and hydrogen. We have two molecules here, we have the two uh, hydrogen molecules of CH4. We keep going down on these numbers here, and we have here essentially a, a number which represents the thermal efficiency of 58%, process efficient hydrogen production, and uh, uh, it goes through a pyrolyzer, it goes through a CH4 separation is needed, a solid sea landfill mines and market, and the overall result of different, the two times 58% to be compared to 60%. So the two systems are really quite similar. The energy, however, is not lost, it's stored. And this is a very important difference, in, in, and there is no CO2 emissions. The, the high uh, uh, in material potentials, it's the, the uh, uncertainty a minimal, and needs, of course, needs development, as we are here for. Okay, uh, so let me uh, then lead to the next subject, which is hydrogen for the next fuel transportation. Uh, hydrogen, much has been said and much money has been spent on, uh, on the hydrogen economy as a substitute for oil. Hydrogen is a chemical product, is already widely used as a number of fields, which include, for instance, production of ammonia, cracking of petrol. Its energy is about 4% of one of oil. 4% of oil is represented in hydrogen. Hydrogen is a lot of hydrogen. And mostly out of neutral gas, uh, natural gas production. Merely an energy carrier, the choice of the source of hydrogen is a key element related to the amount of decarbonization. Notwithstanding, 
fundamental problem will have to be solved if hydrogen gas is ever to become directly a practical everyday transportation fuel, which can be filled into the tanks of the engine as easily, as safely as gasoline of today. The chances that lay ahead seem prohibitive. In many people's view, the necessary future substitute to petrol for transport must be liquid, containing therefore primarily hydrogen, oxygen, and CO2. So this has brought in the second alternative we are working on, which is the possibility of liquid substitute to oil, which we call the methanol economy. The most promising alternative with respect to what has been called the methanol economy, which combines the use of hydrogen produced by the same mineral cleavage through the process of the already spent CO2 and carbon, and the argument is there, CO2 plus hydrogen goes so to methanol plus water. Uh, the hydrogen is, of course, produced by the previous method I mentioned before. Methanol is a convenient liquid fuel for transportation. Methanol can be already, also already converted into many other chemicals like ethylene, propylene, and others. Hydrogen production, in turn, is an important chapter, especially for natural gas, gas in three ways. First possibility is the classic steam reforming method, which I mentioned at the beginning, in which you get natural gas plus water going CO2 plus hydrogen, which, however, produces a large amount of CO2. The cooking process, which is the process which we have mentioned a minute ago, which we are working on uh, it, uh, with, the, with the people in this, in this room, with no CO2 emission, which is CH4 becomes carbon and hydrogen, and the formation of solid carbon. A third alternative is proposed by a Nobel Prize winner, Mr. Ola, is a so-called bioreforming procedure in which it takes in one single lump CH4, water, CO2, makes a big soup, and out of the big soup, it comes directly the product productivity of methanol. So methanol can be produced in three different ways. Of course, my uh, uh, preferred solution is this one, which is, uh, which is the one of producing black carbon with no CO2 emissions. Now, the, as you will see then, what we are going to do with it is the next transparency. You see here a, rep a representation of this situation. You can see from this curve that the, we start with natural gas uh, produced there. We make a decomposition of natural gas with the production of carbon. You can see up there, carbon production and hydrogen coming out. And down here, you have uh, the uh, CO2 uh, from a process, already used CO2 by accumulated by some kind of activity. So you have CO2, spent CO2 accumulation. This is the primary purpose of today. Tomorrow we can have other changes which can modify the situation gradually. Down here, we have one dream, which is not so much of a dream, but which we are thinking about and probably are going to be working on, which is the idea to, to recover CO2 from the air. It is probably likely, in fact, it is almost uh, convincing, but not quite to be able to discuss it so, uh, so seriously, that the, the long-range idea will be uh, to recover some of this bloody CO2 from the air and then uh, re uh, reuse it again uh, indefinitely. That will be, of course, a, a dream which we can discuss about and it is, which is included in this discussion here. The other possibility here is, of course, the producing the hydrogen production, this is CO2 production, hydrogen production, the possibility of making electrolyzers of water up here, electric from uh, nuclear or solar uh, systems down here, and up there we have the possibility of concentrated solar energy, and we can pr produce direct production of uh, solar into hydrogen, and this is something which has been discussed by a number of things. For instance, in Almeria, there are lots of people working on this. It's certainly an alternative and a possibility. So that will be replace the chapter of hydrogen progressively from out of this into that, and here the CO2 uh, uh, using the existing CO2 will be used recovering CO2 from the atmosphere if this is at all possible. It's not that absurd. Now, all these things go together and create methanol. A methanol is a synthesis reactor of methanol coming out, and you produce methanol down here. And then methanol goes to, can be transported, because then methanol is a liquid. You can put it in the, into, a, into a ship and carry it wherever it is required. And then you can have all kinds of activities which are possible there, some of which will regenerate <coughs> some more CO2, which can come back here. In some other cases, it's going to go off and be lost forever. Essentially, 
Uh, the basic idea is the process to have a spent CO2 recovery from some of these applications back into the system to keep the CO2 running continuously. Uh, now, the methanol derived chemical products are extremely large. You can see here methanol coming in there, and you can see the huge number of chemical compounds which are used by modern chemical industry. This is coming from the OLA diagram. And you can see that methanol, just like oil, can be a perfectly entry point to an enormous variety of applications which have to do with chemistry, with physics, with uh, energy, with other applications and forms. So this is the beginning of a very rich and enormous solution. So our solution is go for liquid, take a liquid from fossils, possibly eliminating CO2 emissions, and try to get this, uh, this new replacement of oil as a tentative and possible source for not only for energy, but also for all the chemicals which are associated with uranium. Now, build, now, the next question is, but natural gas is becoming an important issue. So how much natural gas can we have, or can we improve the situation of natural gas? Building up the exploitation of natural gas. The progress of progressive decarbonation of fossil goes necessary to increase use and consumption of methane. Methane is the fossil fuel with the largest decarbonization for full combustion produces two and a half times less coal than coal for the same energy. With the alternative process in which methane is converted into hydrogen and black carbon, we should be able to achieve the dream of burning fossils without additional CO2 emissions. But how can we increase the further availability of natural gas if natural gas is so good that we can allow you to go into a clean production of energy through hydrogen in this way? Besides the conventional supply of natural gas, it is worth underlining there are extremely vast quantities of methane traps in the form of oceanic hydride deposits, which are called clathrates. And let me briefly mention the situation of new and conventional sources of natural gas. You say clathrates. What the hell is a clathrate? Many people, very few people know what a clathrate is. A clathrate is methane hydride, it's the most abundant natural form of clathrate a unique class of chemical substances in which molecules of one material, in this case just plain water, the same water we have here, form an open solid lattice that encloses, without chemical bonding, appropriately sized molecules of the other material, in this particular case of methane. You can see here from this picture on top, the methane uh, in green sitting in a structure of water, which is red, and that system is your clathrate. You can see down here, this clathrate, sorry, while it is stable at temperatures of up to 100, zero degrees, the, at higher pressure, the methane clathrates remain stable up to 18 degrees. One liter of methane clathrate, solid, would contain, on the average, 168 liters of methane gas. So a clathrate is the highest density of liquid uh, uh, natural gas, much denser than the production of liquid methane, the one, for instance, used to transport methane from uh, Saudi Arabia to various places in the world. And 168 liters of methane goes into one liter. So one liter is, is corresponding, in other words, to something like 170 atmospheres pressure. Present in the system is a huge amount of system. You can see here a picture of some small uh, pieces of clathrate down there. This is a solid white look like ice. It's very similar to ice. It's a little lighter than ice, but when you take a flame and you put some flame near to it, then the flame is heating up the clathrates. The clathrates becoming hot and freeze the liquid uh, methane, and liquid methane burns, and therefore, in this way, you have constructed a thing called burning ice. Now, this is a very interesting new possibility, because let me show you here uh, uh, a little more about the clathrate. The subject appeared to be poorly academic until recently, when scientists realized that given the ubiquity of both methane, the common product of bacterial breakdown, organic matter, and water in nature, methane hydrate could be present in vast quantities in any environment with suitable pressures and temperatures. Methane, methane clathrate, a common constituent of the shallow marine, marine geosphere, and they occur both in the deep sedimentary structure like outcrops on the <coughs> ocean floor. The potential amount of methane in natural gas hydrate is enormous. With current estimates, which by the way are quite uncertain, so you have to realize people have different point of view, but they are converging on a conservative value of about 
10,000 gigaton of methane carbon. As a comparison, the total estimate for conventional natural gas and oil are of the order of a few hundred gigaton. So we are talking about tens of thousands gigatons of cloth rates compared to something like a few hundred gigatons of the reserves of natural gas and of oil. So we are really talking about something really very massive, very big, which has remained somehow undetected by many people, by the press, by the political media, by the others. No one really knows about that. I asked yesterday, we had a test yesterday, Mr. President, we found that about more than 50% of the people didn't even know the word class rates. And, and so, I mean, this is something for this magnitude, it, it's worth considering. Now, let's look here. Uh, there's a reservoir of methane. Uh, uh, the, uh, globally, within 2,000 meters solid surface, uh, a, a large number of locations and major interest potential resources. Now, let me show you here this picture. This is the, the spots, are the balls there, the light, right red uh, lights are recovered and infer occurrences. You can see that the whole bloody uh, ocean is filled with that stuff. And you can see, for instance, here that uh, you can see that not only all this line here, all these people there, even in, in, in Spain, you, you see, this is you. You have places where such a thing may occur. So why should you go and get your bloody uh, natural gas from Siberia when you can go and get it directly from yourself? And there is plenty of it, and it doesn't cost you anything because it's your own, you are in the, instead of looking for fish, you can look for that stuff. Now, notice how vast the distribution are everywhere around every aspect. In, wherever it was looked for, it was found. You see there are ocean here, there's north here, there is uh, India, that place is, of course, the Japanese are very excited about that, so this is the number of spots you see there. It's directly proportional to the interest people have into this. Latin American is extremely rich, so I mean, a thing like this, which give you uh, the possibility of extracting, if a possibility can be found, and it's up to us to find it. This is new research and development, and it can give you an amount of energy which vastly larger, even if it is equal to ordinary methane, it could be a tremendous opportunity. Why don't we have a little more money, a little more effort, a little more interest in developing this? Why do we have to ask uh, crazy scientists to go and discuss it? And this thing is not being re re received by the oil industry, by all these people who are doing this and that and the other, because, I mean, it looks like a little bit of a, a bit too conservative, I might say. Now, the other question with the class rate, which is worth mentioning, is the cause of past extinctions. There are five extinctions indicated there with this line, which correspond to different times of millions of years. And this is a timeline known as mass extinction events. Mass extinction is the only thing Darwin forgot about. Darwin never assumed that the whole of a certain uh, class of uh, elements could be destroyed by some external element. Some of the effects are produced by meteorite, some others are presumably produced by uh, climatic changes which are related to the presence of CO2. And what is really happening, you'll see in a minute, I will describe the most severe extinction is the Permian Triassic uh, uh, that occurred here, is indicated with the Little Rhine 251 million years ago, in which 96% of all marine species and 70% of terrestrial vertebrates species becoming extinct. Is, this is known as the mother of mass extinction. What was happening there is that having lost the presence of ice inside the, uh, the ocean, the mechanism of producing movement of the ocean has been strongly reduced because the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, ice in the uh, uh, Arctic and Antarctica are pumps which are producing movement of water which allow the water to circulate with the Gulf Stream, etc., and you get with it some oxygen which fish can breathe. If you have a situation of a different kind of this type, that all the, all the natural species disappear because you cannot anymore breathe into the waters. They have somewhat relate, they have been a mass, somewhat related to the massive degassing of cloth rate accentuated by pre-existing warming trend with a global temperature rise about 6 to 10 degrees. However, if when you're talking about 250 million years ago, uh, the uncertainties are very large, and certainly other solutions are, however, not excluded. Other runway phenomena may have coexisted. The tremendous CO2-related changes in Earth climate that occur in the past, however, correspond to a global warming much greater of the today's anthropogenic hazards, and for the moment, we are still far away, way far away from a return of all the cluster rates, although we don't know what kind of uh, processes 
amplifying processes may be developed by nature in such a way that a small little, I mean, remember that uh, the, the uh, climatic changes like weather forecast, where you have, you know, the, the, uh, the butterfly in Alaska, which is creating a hurricane in some other places. This kind of phenomena exists for all uh, natural uh, phenomena, and they could also exist, it could also exist on the dimension of the major climatic changes. But this is the kind of question that we have ahead of us. Now, temperature dependent of the uh, last 65 million years with respect to today's uh, 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 average temperature indicated in this graph. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry, I went a little bit too fast. You can see here the, uh, that 80, 65 million years ago, you have this PTEM up there. And we know there that 1,500 to 2,000 gigatons of carbon were suddenly released in the at ocean atmosphere system in two successive pulses and with deep water anore anorexic and marine extinctions. And you can see this little sharp line, it probably could be due by the fact that you suddenly start up the re-emission of the uh, clathrates, which are producing, remember, clathrate is 100 times more, more, more powerful as a greenhouse uh, gas than normal system. Anyway, uh, we are now below here, so it, we still have a lot of space to go, but the uh, delta T, this is the Vostok temperature, which is indicated there, which is the main temperature measured with the, uh, by the Vostok uh, experiment. And you can see there that, in fact, if you go to 10 to 12 degrees uh, above the limit, then phenomena like this kind of explosions or this kind of uh, production of a recurrent element produced by... So there is something to worry about clathrate, which has to do with understanding what happened to our planet in the last years, and that is, by the way, something absolutely fundamental scientifically. We don't have to know only when the Big Bang has occurred. We also don't understand what happened uh, in or the Earth itself over the very long history where a lot of things happen and very little is really known, and presumably also very few people are working on it. Okay, now, let me briefly close with, a, with an idea of uh, uh, transporting power lines. Uh, this is another subject on which we are working. Let me show you very briefly here a thousand miles, six megawatts uh, line equivalent, you can see that you need a huge amount of, uh, of power lines, look at the size of the system, to transmit the voltage over a few thousand kilometers with a power line. Uh, and uh, then, of course, if we are going to go superconductivity, then we are going to build a very small little tube of uh, 40 centimeter diameter, and it can be run up to cryo plants every 100 kilometers. This table is very small. I don't expect you can read it. There are three columns. And there. One represents the use of normal superconductors, the same use in LHC, and the other in ether and so forth, helium-based. The second column is representing magnesium boride, which is something which can work with hydrogen. The third alternative is a so-called warm a warmer superconductor which can operate with liquid nitrogen uh, alternatives, and they are all uh, possibilities. It's certainly something which is worth studying. Now, how much time do I have left? Uh, do we have, how uh, many do we? What? So I can give me another 20 minutes, is that possible? So I would like to talk about thorium as an almost inexhaustible new energy for nuclei. Let me give you that in my early days when I was interacting with, uh, with Spain, and we have many of the people here around this table today also present, we have tried to build a, a system in, uh, of building some energy amplifier solution as a way of creating an exhaustible a new energy for nuclei. That project was too early to be accepted. In fact, he never got the necessary support when the, there was a microscopic change in the government. The thing disappeared like a, like a cloth rate on the air, and nothing was left at the end, and we had, uh, we accept, we have learned a lot of things. We all have learned a lot of things. And let me also remind you, I get the opportunity to mention that one person we really pushed very hard on this was one Antonio Rubio that we already, we all know about, in which he most uh, uh, terribly miss because he just left us uh, from President Tosiemat over the last uh, few months. And this kind of stuff is, in fact, uh, part of this old history, but still the show is going, is going on. And now we have a lot of people, as you'll see in a minute, in developing country in China, the 
and in, in, in India and other places like this we go on, so I will briefly discuss that. So, new nuclear energies. Although the exact amount of explodable uranium ores are not exactly known and depend on the lowest levels of recovery, as long as used with today's methods at the present level of consumption, 6.5% of the primary energy is nuclear energy today, there are probably left no more reserve of uranium than oil and gas. Maybe a few years more, a few years less, but I mean, when one disappears, the other will follow very promptly. Particularly interesting are fission reactors, new reactions, with, without uranium-235, in which a natural element is first bred to, into a fissionable one. There are different reactions. And there are two of these reactions which are known. One of them is thorium, which becomes uranium-233. Thorium is not fissile, but uranium-233 is fissile. So the fissile uranium is, uh, uh, with the new, second neutron, is going to a thorium cycle. The total number of neutrons is 2.3, but two neutrons are needed. One to make the thorium into uranium, and the second one to make the uranium into fission. So you have 2.3 to start with, and two is the minimum demand. Similar argument is down below for uranium. Uranium-238 plus a neutron can be the so-called uh, uh, de depleted uranium, or standard uranium plus pl neutron can become plutonium, and plutonium can become a free fusion. Is the other, it gives you also the same process. Now, the, these sources of energy available for exploitable ores are very huge, enormously large, and comparable to the one for deuterium thorium, uh, thorium fusion reaction, which are, in fact, promised to be there for tens of thousands of years and so forth and so on. So there is a big difference between these breeding reactions coming from natural thorium and natural uranium uh, from uh, the situation of the uranium-235 as a special uh, sub-element. And you can see, in fact, that if tomorrow there will be nuclear energy in some kind of a way, sooner or later, you'll be obliged to change the style because the uranium-235 will get more and more costly, more and more difficult to get. And energy, these things provide energy from nuclei, these three reactions thorium cycle, uranium cycle, fusion energy for nuclear for many millennia to come, millennia. Now, the question today I'm discussing is how much thorium is available. Thorium, which is a simple, simple isotope, thorium-235, is a huge but unexploitable energy resource. The total abundance is, is estimated to 120 trillion tons, i.d. 10 to the 14 tons. Soil contains on the average six parts per million of thorium. If you take just the total earth surface and you ask how much thorium there is there, six parts per million. This is the same amount as lead, for instance. Lead is also six parts per million. And monazite black sand deposits are composed, are composed by from two to 22 percent of, of thorium. Estimated available resources vary very widely. Uh, the 2007 publication gave us 4 million tons of known thorium resources, but this excludes data from much of the world. For instance, China produces 120 kilotons per year of rare earth metals, our rare earth metal, with 12 kilotons per year of recoverable thorium waste. With well designed thorium burner, the 2007 electricity of China, which is 3.2 trillion kilowatt hour, requires burning only 433, 443 tons a year. So you produce every year 12 kilotons, which is waste because it's not used. It's already paid by the rare earths, zero cost. And 443 tons per year will give you all the energy of China with energy amplifiers. So 443 is a small number respect to 12 kilotons per year. It is what already they are accumulating and they're putting somewhere every year. The 2008 figures for U.S. geological survey gives for China 8.9 tons for a rear earth metal basic reserve, reserves, huh? adequate for 20,000 years of today's China electricity with no import reliance. So the only way out that a country like China and other countries like India have is total reliance on a perfectly abundant material source which is thorium. Now, the important characteristic, of course, is here that while in a thorium breeding reactor you need two neutrons instead of one, and you have 2.3 to make with, the first neutron, as I said, is required to produce the fissionable element, and the second neutron is to burn it and to create 
some more neutrons. So eta is to be larger than two. You can see here that the, in this line you can see the uh, uranium-233 line, which is above two, both from thermal, for resonance reason, and for fast reactor. You can see that the plutonium, plutonium is below two for thermal reactor. So it's not possible to build a plutonium breeder reactor with thermal neutrons, you're obliged to, neither with the excitation, you have to go to fast neutrons. So the plutonium is super phoenix, uh, sodium, fast neutrons is a necessary alternative, while thorium can go everywhere, it can be thermal, it can be in the resonance region, it can be fast. And in fact, it turns out that all the three possibilities are being discussed, so thorium is a much easier uh, source of a system besides the fact that plutonium it's uh, it's not so easy because to carry around la massive amount of plutonium may have some kind of uh, uh, consequences so only fast uh, neutrons are for uranium plutonium but all the others are disposable now the point is now let me very very brief in this statement saying that uh, we in order to get this system working, however, we have 2.3 neutrons to start with and two neutrons needed, and the neutron excess is absolutely necessary. One can class the sub six, in, in the sub critical cycle, you have to introduce neutron contribution in the external source, and this is, uh, uh, is created today with a particle accelerator. So without a particle accelerator, you cannot, it's very hard to close the balance of neutrons because this number 2.3 is for an infinitely large reactor. Reactor is the final size. There are many other reasons for losing neutrons. So you need a, a supply of neutrons from external. And the supply of neutrons is perfectly available with a... With a uh, there are two ideal scenarios which are possible. One of them is the fast energy amplifier in which you use lead, lead bismuth or sodium. And the other possibility is a molten salt liquid fluoride fuel in which is a, this is a thermal of a subthermal system in which lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride is added to an actinide. <coughs> they are all fluoride and they are used to run the reactor at, in, the, in the resonance region. Let me show you here the two configuration. On the left, you can see the configuration energy amplifier, which was the one which we are discussing also. As I remember, we had done in Spain in the early days. This is the scenario which by now is a number of years old. And down here is the situation for the molten salt. In the molten salt system, you have a container. You have some liquid, which contains the uh, inside already the thorium. The beam comes in and is dissipated in the liquid, in the same liquid. The liquid is recirculated with a pump, so the liquid goes out into a heat exchanger, so the heat is taken out. So you essentially, you run with a proton beam here. You, you, you have in here a multiplication coefficient, which multiplies the energy by a big factor. The multiplied energy produces heat. The heat is extracted by a pump, and the pump is used at the heat exchanger to be used at the direct electricity. Both methods are being used. China, and they are really going for this. They have found that the, the, uh, this, this solution is a better solution, but the, the other one is also a perfectly legitimate solution. Let me show you briefly the scenario. Here you have a situation in which you have a, a, an accelerator. This is a typical accelerator for a one gigawatt machine, which is a machine I I identical to the one already existing in, in Zurich. This is a cyclotron, which has again produces a beam with a gain of 700. The beam goes into the, here goes into energy amplifier. It could be either of the two. Heat is coming out, because the turbine produces electricity. Some of the electricity is made available to run back the accelerator only a few percent, and the rest is used to use the external system. After a number of years, which is typically of the over 10 years, the fuel discharge is required essentially because <coughs> in this system, the, the, the material, the cladding, etc., etc., has reached the excess, the maximum uh, radiation allowed, and the fuel is excess. Now, the, there is a partition here, actinides, which are essentially uranium-233, is re reingested into the system, so the uranium and thorium it runs continuously up to exhaustion, so nothing comes out of here. It, it comes in here, there is an extra fresh thorium supply 
which is coming here to replace the thorium you have burnt. You burn in total 2.9 ton of thorium, and you have to replace with 2.9 ton of thorium, but the rest is just moving around out of complete exhaustion. There is nothing coming out. The only thing coming out are the fission fragments, which are producing a strong radioactivity, but short-lived, and this is effectively put into a package, vitrified or whatever, and goes to a secular repository because the lifetime of the longest of these things is about 22 years, 20 years, so it's a, a something, uh, al cabril type of reaction. It's not deep underground solution. It's a secular repository which can be done also for the shortest of the time under presence of a guard, and therefore it can be done on, on surface. So we, sorry, so you see here the two elements in this, sorry, one is the closed loop for the reprocessing, which goes to a closed loop, and the fuel flow is coming in, thorium comes in, and, and uh, fish and frying come out, and everything else is sealed, is closed. Now, let me show you here some of the factors which are relevant to this. Let me show you all those curves very briefly because time is going by. You can see here three elements which are shown here. You can see the top line there is, a, is this is a function of time, this is a function of time. The amount of uh, 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 is a function of time. This is the the uh, the uh, radio ingestive radiotoxicity of the material. You can see on top the ingestive radiotoxicity of an ordinary reactor. This is a standard pressurized water reactor, the one you're using, for instance, in Spain or elsewhere. You can see that you have a first component coming from fission fragment coming down, but then the actinides keep going and they go forever. This is an ordinary water reactor that after a thousand years has barely start moving its own activity. If you go to an energy amplifier with thorium-based, this is the application of a thorium amplifier as we decided, for instance, in, when we worked in Spain. You can see here uh, this kind of thing is essentially driven by the fission fragment and it comes down extremely rapidly. And you can see that after a few hundred years, it comes to a level which is corresponding to the radioactivity of a coal for the same energy. Coal is also radioactive. So this is something you can, nobody, no way, no return. This, the waste can return to an environment because at this moment uh, you can safely distribute the system again. You compare this with a fusion, which is an important element. Here is a magnetic fusion, as was described here by Martinez Valle and his company. And you can see that, uh, at Perlado and others, you can see that magnetic fusion and energy amplifier have similar characteristics. So that they both tell you that the reactivity is very intense to start with in both cases, but after 500 years, gone. In 500 years, something reasonable, not millions of years. Now, this is a second magnetic fusion model, which was described also by you. You require special materials. This is a magnetic fusion model using more conventional materials. So uh, development will go from here to there, but essentially, in both cases, the important thing is that we go below that line over there. OK, now, let's go to the next step here and give you comparing alternatives. And to compare the alternative, let me tell you a very simple question. Continue to generate the power of one gigawatt electric for one year. One gigawatt electric is a big power station. It's a big nuclear reactor. It runs 100% of the time for one year. Actually, 70% because there's some recovery. Uh, if you do it with coal, you have it written here. You need 3.5 million tons of coal. And this is 3.5 million on tons of coal is a lot of coal. I mean, you remember, 3.5 million tons means, uh, it means that you have to, it's a, it's a significant impact on the environment. There are a lot of CO2 emissions and everything else, you know what the problem is of running with coal. Now, if I go to the pressurized water reactor, I, my amount of material is strongly reduced. I require 200 tons of uranium. This is natural uranium. I have low CO2 impact. But I will have challenges with reprocessing. Reprocessing is not a trivial system. La Hague and uh, the cellar fields are not a very pleasant place where to be. And the very long storage of hazard waste, I mean, the lifetime of this material lasts uh, geologically, lasts until uh, millions of years and so forth and so on. There's a proliferation problem. Remember, two pieces of uranium, uh, you have uh, the bomb of Hiroshima, was 60% enriched uranium, which was, uh, which was put together and gave Hiroshima. And now, such an explosion could be done 
by just taking 60% uh, uranium, which is highly rich uranium, but there is plenty of it around. And if you have, a, a, it does need to have a, a instrumental development, it does need to uh, make it process, because you can have a crazy man with two of these pieces doing like that. And that will be sufficient to make the whole thing go, and you'll have an Hiroshima-like model. There are lots of people which are crazy enough to decide one day eventually to commit uh, to commit uh, suicide or whatever and uh, do such a mess as producing a very substantial nuclear reaction. The uranium is sufficiently safe that you don't have to measure. Plutonium, you have to have a special bomb, etc. Et but uranium, is you, just a fast contact is enough and it can be generated by anybody. And uranium is extremely easy to carry. You can carry uranium on an airplane and it's very hard to see it because it just as very most protection will eliminate the background. So there's a lot of proliferation, and there is also the question of enrichment. Enrichment is a process in which you take natural uranium into enriched uranium. We have the typical problem of Iran, which wants to do this. What, what it does it for? We know that other countries like, like Brazil and Argentina have recently acquired the right to enrich. And the enrichment to go from 3% enrichment to uh, bomb grade enrichment it's only 40% of the time. In other words, you have a huge amount of time to enrich from natural uranium to 3%. But then if you continue enriching faster and faster, the process goes faster and faster, and you need only 40% longer time with the same system, the same devices, to go all the way to a fully enriched system. So you have all those problems, which you know about, and, of course, it has to be taken into account. I mean, whether you like it or not is a different question. Whether you can permit it or not is a different question. Now, if we want to go to uh, thorium, we only need one ton of thorium. So 200 tons of uranium. And thorium is much more abundant than, than uranium. We've seen how much there is in various countries. Low CO2 impact can eliminate plutonium and radioactive waste. Reduce quantity and much shorter duration for the storage of hazardous waste. We've shown that in 500 years, like in the case of fusion, we are back. There is no enrichment and no proliferation. So this is representing the various alternatives, and you should really think about that before you conclude that this, uh, this solution of thorium is, is a crazy idea. In short, safety. Is, thorium is not critical. Credibility, proven zero power. Fuel is natural. Thorium, no uh, enrichment. Availability is practically unlimited. You can say 20,000 years by just picking up the, 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 uh, the amount of uh, thorium which is in China. Chemistry of fuel can be regenerated every 10 years, 5 to 10 years. Waste disposal, they become like coal ashes, so they can go back to the environment after 600 years. The operation is very similar to the reactors. It's very well extrapolated from reactors. The technology is there. There's no major barrier. The proliferation resistance is excellent, and the cost of energy, and this is the last important thing, is definitely compatible with the one of fossils. Okay, so let me conclude now very briefly with five minutes of concluding remarks. Need for true innovation. This is what is the mission which I'm giving to present to you as a presentation. Coherent energy policy is required. Strategic choices have to be made, relying on truly innovative scientific and technological development in order to reconcile sustainable development and economic growth with the threat of environmental decay. Our society will depend crucially on uninterrupted and differentiated, uninterrupted and differentiated energy supply. Therefore, major steps have to be taken in order to avoid geopotential, geopolitical and price vulnerability. And this is a problem which we all have. We should play a very important role in order to foster the absolutely necessary fundamental breakthrough and catalyze innovation in a coherent international framework. And the meeting you had today and yesterday is precisely on the idea of creating a coherent international network. So you're right on the right wavelength for these kind of considerations. Only through such a concentrated, a coordinated effort, leadership can be targeted and the objective of creating high quality employment opportunities and a better quality of life be met. The lifetime of the future generation and their jobs are all dependent on having plenty of cheap and abundant energy. If we stop the energy production, the consequence will be immense for the rest of the mankind. Innovation, the key to successful development. This problem and potential threat are central to the scope of modern science. We are not doing something which scientists should not worry about it. 
This is a typically something the scientists must continue and worry about fully. To solve the challenges, carefully evaluated and solved. So we are on the right track. It's our job to do this. But the question is, <coughs> is if mankind will have the common political will <coughs> to act in front of these dangers, if he can reach the understanding and assess the probability of avoiding, uh, assess the probability of avoiding the menaces. And this, I think, our political environment has some short-sighted problems in many of these subjects, as far as I'm concerned. Conclusions. Decisions which have to be taken over the next 10 to 15 years will have profound consequences for energy security, for climate change, for growth, and for jobs. All of them have to be ahead of us. The cost of action may be high, but the price of inactivity much higher. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this exciting talk. I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions. We made an hour, it's correct. With questions? Uh, Rojo, my friend. Juan, how are you? Well, thank you very much, Carlos, for this very exciting talk. Uh, I have a question about methanol. What? Methanol. Methanol. Methanol air. How do you call that? Uh, mm, uh, economy. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, the, the main point is the source of the hydrogen. And in terms of econ economy, you have to take care about that. My question has to do with the different sources you mentioned in connection with the uh, reaction production, production uh, uh, methanol. Uh, am I right in saying that of those different sources, there were two or three of them which required much development before being able to operate, where there is one that in, involving hydrogen from electrolytically uh, decomposed water, that at least if you use nuclear energy to decompose water is very well known and can be estimated economically. And my question is, would we gain time to begin this sequestration of CO2 if we used a technique which we know which is well uh, uh, tested to, is, to get the hydrogen from. You, mean you are talking uh, about hydrogen uh, produced by nuclear power. That's what, from nuclear energy. No, to, say why we should not use nuclear energy to make hydrogen and be happy with that? Well, and now the question is, of course, that uh, uh, first of all, let me say there is a Carnot cycle in between. There's a Carnot cycle in between. And this is, in a way, a kind of problem which we have. If we want to produce hydrogen and use hydrogen in either directly or as, a, as a ethanol or methanol to run a car, and if the hydrogen is coming from a, from a nuclear reactor, technically this is perfectly possible. I included in the box there. I indicated there. In, in the graph which I showed you, you can see that uh, the nuclear is a perfectly legitimate source. The question is, unfortunate that we are living in a situation in which the cheapest energy is the best energy. And, and people are considering the fact that uh, nuclear energy uh, will have to, we, the production of hydrogen will not be 100% because we have to be, the a thermodynamically efficient nuclear reaction is 33%, 30%. So about one third, you need three times more nuclear power to produce a certain electric power, then you do hydrogen. And then that hydrogen has to become, through electrolysis, being produced. Electrolysis is a perfectly legitimate process. It's well understood, and, and it gains a little bit if you keep it a little warmer. A high temperature gets a better situation. But the best uh, fuel cell, the best, uh, uh, if you like, uh, electrolysis give you an efficiency of uh, some 70% or something like that by the time you're finished. So the 30% becomes 20%. So only one-fifth of your nuclear energy will become hydrogen. Then your hydrogen is to become methanol. And methanol has to go into the car. And the car will have something like 20-25% efficiency in becoming mechanical force again. So at the end of the run, all this circle is giving you a, a result that you can do it, but since you produce so much more upstream than downstream, 
it will have to have a larger, uh, you'll have a, a higher cost because you have to do more, more of it. On the other hand, it is also clear that uh, we have looked at solar applications with uh, hydrogen production, and we have done a lot of people have done a lot of work. Direct splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen is not possible because water splits in hydrogen and oxygen only at temperatures which are several thousand degrees, which are beyond uh, accept te today's technology. And the, the re, uh, these material re-emit light, and so you have losses and so forth. But there are intermediate reactions which are developed in which you do some kind of process. For instance, one reaction, interesting reaction, is the when of taking, uh, for instance, uh, oxide of uh, uh, some oxide, uh, uh, for instance, uh, and the oxide is under the sun transforming itself into oxygen plus the metal, and that the metal is in contact with water is producing some hydrogen and the oxide again. So you have a possibility of uh, transforming uh, at lower temperatures through the help of oxides, oxo reduction processes. You can do a simple thing. We have some tests in done, and we have even discussed a lot of things in, in CMAT when I was in CMAT. It's a, certainly a second generation, second generation process. In my view, uh, the solution of if we, there's plenty of energy from fossils, plenty of energy from fossils, and, and if we can solve the problem of transforming uh, methane into uh, into uh, into uh, into uh, directly into hydrogen, then we are back in, in in square zero. Actually, today the cost today of uh, of most of the hyd commercial hydrogen is produced by uh, transforming it from natural gas. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, four percent of the uh, oil is used to make hydrogen. Uh, four percent natural gas is made to use to make hydrogen. So it's a very large thing. You produce, for instance, with that you produce ammonia. Ammonia production is all based on the production of uh, hydrogen coming from, from, uh, from hydrogen production. The mini application hydrogen, uh, uh, which is not a Zeppelin solution, but it is certainly something which is, because the chemical is, very, is also used to transform oils, uh, gasoline of some type, go to another type, use hydrogen in order to, to, to thinen the, uh, the amount of uh, oils which is used in various solutions. So hydrogen is a fantastically important element which is very vastly used by industry. If we can do that using natural gas, not with that process of natural gas which already exists, but the alternative of heating it with, uh, as I said at the beginning, with, uh, with black carbon, this is an alternative. But it doesn't exclude the possibility of doing what you say. I, I don't feel that... Uh, we should exclude solutions. I mean, only nature will decide which one is the best, I think. <laughs> we know that many of these solutions are bound to be failures. But even at the time of the Silicon Valley, only one out of three of the ideas people developed, we in fact gave money back. But the one which win at cleaning up everything else. Uh, nuclear could be, in fact, if you would solve all the nuclear problems, a possibility. And there's no doubt that you can do a lot of uh, hydrogen with nuclear. At the present moment, price-wise, it's much cheaper to, to burn natural gas. Now, natural gas is a very important question of cloth rates, which I was mentioning to you. If we can use even a small fraction of cloth rates, then we'll give a new wind, new support to the natural gas solution, which will be a, a, a good step of reducing the amount of CO2, because as I said, Carbon, uh, coal is using two and a half more times more CO2 for the large natural gas to do things and so forth and so on. So I think we have to continue saying that no objection is excluded and what you say uh, one is, you know, is perfectly a good solution and is certainly worth considering. But the decision will come from those commercial economical arguments and the problem is not, they're not one solution. All, the problem is that we are not including every solution. We are including no solution at all because we are sitting on our back and waiting for do nothing. And this is not an acceptable condition. I am perfectly happy to see some people building a, using some reactors, some nuclear power, and get hydrogen with it. And use the hydrogen not directly to put it into the car because this is very difficult. Zeppelin will, ex will hydrogen is explosive. But if you go through a, a, a methanol, why not? It's a perfectly legitimate solution. In fact, I included that in the, in the block diagram which you showed, so I think I agree 100% with you. More questions? 
I have a question. Good morning. My name is Pilar Barreiro. I come from the Agricultural College. From what? The Agricultural School. Uh, my question would be, do you, do you hear me? Sorry. Uh, my question would be, we have seen thermal... I mean, we have an echo here. It's hard to hear what you're saying. Okay. Do you hear me better like this? Well, go ahead. He speaks slowly. I will understand you. Somebody will translate okay. to me. My question is, uh, I see different thermal efficiencies, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. Do we have the, the key of what is the thermal efficiency of living organism? Of, of what? Uh, living organism. Uh, living organism. Do we living? have... A Liquid what? What? No, it's the same thing. I come down so I can hear better for you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's a very good question. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, first of all, let me say the following. Let me come forward so I can hear better because the, we have a funny, funny echo in there. Now, living organisms, first of all, they're not made to make energy. And the basic uh, process of uh, creating, uh, uh, for instance, say, uh, the, uh, the organism, for the plants, for instance, a tree is only using 0.2% of the energy in form of burning energy. It runs for 20 years and then you can burn it in an hour. So clearly there's a very lot. This is a, the f f chlorophyllian function is, in fact, a logical system because the purpose of the organism is the one of reproduction, is an art of development, is a kind of evolution, it's not a question of energy producer. We are a energy production for the living organism, whether it's a, a, veg, a tree or whether it's algae or whatever it is, it is something which is rather an, a, an incorrect behavior respect to what is the main purpose. Uh, the number of producing energy with the sunlight on a tree is typically 0.2%. So 0.2% becomes wood, and then you can cut the wood. To cut the wood, you also have to put some energy because the wood, either you are very strong muscles, or you have used a, you use something like a, like a car or a truck or something to take it out. You may use algae or other things like this, which may be more efficient, but no one so far has been able to compete in producing uh, this uh, kind of electricity in, in a sensible way from the sun when you compare it, for instance, with photovoltaic, which now is something like 12% or 15%, and uh, 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 other forms of uh, concentrating solar power, which are about 15% efficient. So the question is uh, that, uh, that uh, the, uh, we have, for instance, the possibility of using energy in Brazil. Brazil is using uh, sugarcane get out of the sugar cane the ethanol, which is just the same as methanol, by the way, of organic nature to do the system. And in fact, it's cheaper in Brazil than ordinary gasoline is used very much. Uh, we have a similar situation in America, except in, some, in America use the same thing used for food, which creates another modern creates a very moral point. Why do we have to use, uh, well, we have millions of people which are dying, which don't have nothing to eat, and we are going to put the food inside our tank. Uh, I mean, this is not a case of uh, case because Brazil, but it's a case of the United States and other places. All those considerations are indicating that this solution, it is possible under certain circumstances, but the amount, for instance, the amount of uh, uh, ethanol produced by Brazil it's equivalent to one day of oil production out of the year. So, I mean, before you transform that into a main production of oil, you have to multiply that by 365. And 365, the size of, of uh, the Brazil, uh, is not possible. It was not my question. We, as living organisms, we are a thermodynamic machines. The persons and the bacteria, and they are thermodynamic machines. What is, do you have an idea what is the thermal efficiency of a, of a machine, or us as a living machine, not us as a substrate to be included in the... Is, is well, I mean, I agree with you. I think it's fine. I think there are a lot of people working on it, and I have no doubt the inventivity of people 
We're also developing, looking at some specific organisms which will announce such a probability. And you're correct when you say the most likely a simple uh, bacteria or something like that will be an easier object to modify and to act upon than taking uh, some big trees and, or use some other more sophisticated materials which have probably a better use than just being burnt. Now, uh, the question, however, is again the, f the following, that uh, so far we don't have it a possible solution this kind. So far, as I say, the amount of sunlight is only, which is fundamentally the, the basic term of equation, is only very, 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 uh, very par partially transformed into, into energy. And this is, again, not noble energy. This is not electricity. Most of the systems like uh, we have today are uh, the renewable energy, wind or whatever, they always go directly into the renewable energy based by electricity, which is a noble energy. While here we have to go through another Carnot cycle to get the other stuff. But I'm not excluding that possibility. I'm saying to you that my argument goes towards recovering and enhancing every form of new development because we don't know where the next idea is going to come from. But the problem is that so far, as I said at the beginning, our problem is not the fact that we don't have, we want to kill some alternative. We are for all alternatives. But the problem is that the present moment, the amount of funding which we have available is extremely small. For instance, the biggest, the largest amount of funding which is done in energy production is ITER. ITER is a very huge effort to produce nuclear energy. Whether it's valuable or not is a different question. But the fact that this represents an enormous amount of money by this, today's energy av availability studies is a fact. Now, the amount of money which will be used to run ITER over 20 years is exactly equal to the wasted money which uh, British Petroleum has had to pay in order to repair the disaster they made in Mexico, off the coast of Mexico. So, I mean, uh, we have uh, the amount of money which is available is huge. For instance, let me give you an example. At $100 a barrel, uh, we, have 80 million, we have 80 million barrels a day at the cost of 100 barrels per day. It's eight billion, eight eight billion dollar every day, coming from a production of oil. Notice that cost of oil is much lower. For instance, if you go to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, the barrel of oil costs you four dollars, but you sell it at one hundred dollars. So it's all profit. So you could argue that that should be used to make alternative sources. Now eight billion per day. Then there is another person which is richer than the the, uh, the rich Arab sheikh which is your Minister of Finances, which doubles the cost of oil because they want to charge you even more money <coughs> than they, they, what is given from, to, from the Arabs to, to transform it into gasoline because there is a tax. And your car, you know that more than 50% of your tax is representing this. So one liter of gasoline, therefore, is getting 16 billion, 16 billion uh, euro per day of expenditure. It is just the, the, the market based on oil, the selling power of oil. With 16 billion per day, you ask yourself what kind of fraction is being reinvested into develop novel form of energy. It's a, it's a big zero because, as I say, the cost of ether is 16 billion. And it is one in 20 years. So one day out of 20 years is used to make ether, maybe a few others to do something else. Most of the money is spent in developing uh, alternative sources of energy, which are not the most recommendable. For instance, shales, uh, other things, uh, producing oil from, from, uh, from uh, coal, which are much more wasteful against the environment. Now, you know that 2009, the consumption of CO2 has dropped to 1%, respect to what it was. But this was obviously due to the financial crisis, because in 2010, the gas, the amount of natural, uh, the CO2 emission went up 3%. So we are in a situation in which we don't do anything, we don't spend any money, we don't reinvest the money into energy associated sources, whichever they are. But we are burning away our resources at a tremendously uh, heavy system, and lots of people profit out of that, except that we are not prepared to, to, you know, it's a story of <coughs> the famous story of La Fontaine of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, 
of the you know of the the two animals one which is a uh, uh, careful what that's right so we are not doing that because essentially the the political people don't realize that uh, they assume that there will be plenty of they have not first accepted the idea they could be a major disaster in the energy problem we had a major disaster in the in the banks problem without any warning uh, i think we may risk to go into an energy disaster uh, i mean what is going to do lufthansa and uh, in Iberia, if the cost of oil goes to $300 a barrel, how are we going to transport? Because the food, you're right, the food is an element which depends on energy. And if you have a cost of oil goes up, the cost of food goes up. In fact, you can see that the cost of food is rising nowadays, essentially because the energy consumption is rising. So, I mean, as I say, the situation is very fragile. And I think a, a lot of people are worried about the situation. They say, look, we've got to do something on time. Also, because the time required to do a change is very long, because these things don't develop overnight. But we are not, we are not really uh, approaching ourselves correctly, because we have the political body, which listen more to the mass media than they listen to the scientists. And, and this is essentially the reason. The mass media tend to go to a shorter time. We tend to go to longer times. And until we have this kind of equilibrium put in order, I think we are going to run, run into a serious... It's not going to be our problem, but our son. Uh, our children will have a problem. Yeah, I have a question about um, that I've thought several times uh, that from a physical point of view, because we have to consider the, the economy, which I have no idea, but from the physics point of view, um, uh, we have solar energy which is most abundant in places like the Sahara, where uh, it's not needed or it's not uh, used. Um, but what about the possibility of uh, uh, using solar energy in a place like the Sahara um, to produce electricity and then produce hydrogen, which uh, can be stored or can be transported much better than electricity? I'm not so sure. Uh, that electricity, you are raising a very important question. Uh, you say it's easier to transport hydrogen than electricity. It's certainly true today. Why is true? Because you have uh, methane transport and hydrogen transport are very similar. You can transport hydrogen almost 90% of what you can transport uh, natural gas. Uh, the difference is primarily the fact that hydrogen has few problems with the metals, some form of steel, are uh, damaged by the presence of hydrogen, but with some modification you can also run any existing uh, natural gas line with, with hydrogen and will do fine. It will produce 90% of the energy. Uh, we don't have the equivalent for electricity. In electricity, we are usually spending uh, several percent of the line in order to recover the electric consumption. For instance, if I take the example of Desertec, on which we are working in, in Potsdam, as many activities we have ahead of us, in Desertec we have 2,000 square kilometers of mirrors operating by 2050. Well, let's assume it's their assumption and somebody will put their money. But to carry the electricity to 2,000 square kilometers of uh, solar energy from Sahara to the middle of Europe, we require 3,600 square kilometers of lines based on high voltage lines, as I was showing to you. They are very high, they're very tall, they're very wide. They have one kilometer of width to get all, this, all these lines together, and they have to long 3,600 kilometers. Now, this is not a credible solution. It, in my view, you cannot have 2,000 square kilometers of mirrors and 3,600 kilometers of line to get the current of the mirrors into Europe. Uh, and so uh, something has to be done. And I take the point of view that superconductivity might be the solution. So what you say is true, and it is correct that today you cannot transport energy, but electricity, but you can transport gas, natural gas, you can transport oil, 
If you were to use superconductivity, I was describing there before, that might be an alternative. So my answer to you is that you're right today, but give us a chance to see whether with superconductivity we can carry the same amount of energy, large amount of energy over very long distances, essentially with the same kind of technology, the tube essentially, which is the same as used to carry natural gas, hydrogen, you're right, or oil, and so forth and so on. In fact, there is a scenario in which we have considered in which we use hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, transporting it, and the liquid hydrogen is carried away because liquid hydrogen is energy, and then electricity goes with it. So we have also considered a combined scenario in which we use a tube which is carrying liquid uh, hydrogen across a big distance. The, there are some superconducting materials like uh, which can be uh, superconducting in a liquid hydrogen temperature. And so we'll transport the hydrogen and the electricity together. So you'll do the best possible world. You'll have your electric power, you'll have your hydrogen all coming from the Sahara. Now, of course, maybe Mr. Gaddafi is not agreeing with that, but this is not a question. OK, thank, thank you very much. I think we don't have time for more questions. So let's turn our speaker again. OK, thank you very much.